In this video, we're going to build an end-to-end event-driven system from scratch. We're going to use Apache Kafka, we're going to use TypeScript, we're going to use some libraries. We're going to use this as our event source, generating events like these to produce a final effect like this. What's the most interesting source of real-time data? For some people it's price feeds, coming from the stock exchange, telling you when to buy and when to sell. For others it's the answer to a very simple question, is my train coming anytime soon? But one of my personal favourites is something like this. This is a synthesizer. It's a musical instrument. I could lose hours to that. Bleepy bloopy noises. Love them. But as well as being an instrument, this is actually a fantastic source of real-time data. Every time you press a note, every time you turn one of these dials, a little bit of data gets sent over the USB connection using something called the MIDI protocol. Well, I fancy building something with this. So today we're going to crack that protocol open. We're going to take the data, stream it to the cloud, and then stream it back out to a live 3D visualization of all the data it's sending out. We're going to build it completely from scratch using Kafka and JavaScript. Well, actually, Kafka and TypeScript. Wait, wait, is TypeScript a different language, or is it just a preprocessor for JavaScript? Hmm, that's a good question. I think... Oh, wait, I know. It's a transpiler. Ah, oh, yeah. So, TypeScript is a language that transpiles to JavaScript. A transpiler. Transpiler. The point is, we're going to write this in TypeScript, which is basically JavaScript with a bit of extra type checking. Like orange juice, but with bits in it. Yeah, exactly. Let's get started. So we'll start with a completely empty directory, and we'll turn this into a TypeScript development environment. So we add TypeScript and mark it as a development time package. And then we call TSC init, and that should set a basic config file. I will also, for convenience, add Nodemon as a development time package. That's a thing that will live run a process and watch for file changes and reload it. So it makes life a lot easier when you're developing. For that to work with TypeScript, you need a couple more things. You need a TS node, which is a TypeScript aware node runner. And you're going to need the type definitions for nodes libraries. With that, we should have a working TypeScript environment. Let's check. Let's make a source directory and edit a file in there called synth2cloud.ts. And if I say console.log start and come back over here and say yarn node mon source synth to cloud, that should run my very simple console log program. And if I make a small change to it, you should see that it automatically reloads and reruns. So that's enough to get us started writing any TypeScript program. So let's add our first package we need to get this particular job done. It's called Web MIDI. So I'll do yarn add Web MIDI. And it's a package that just makes life a bit easier when you're connecting to a MIDI synthesizer from JavaScript. Thank goodness someone's already done this for us. So. I'm going to say import web MIDI from web MIDI and let's delete that console.log. And what you do is you call web MIDI.enable and that returns a promise. The promise fills when web MIDI has finished enabling the system and I don't know, booting up drivers or something. And inside there we will get uh, a list of inputs, different things that are connected to the computer that are MIDI aware. And I'm going to take those and say, for each input, uh, let's just log that to the console and see what we've got. So that should be that. There, we've got something. So if we have a look at this, it's quite a lot of information. But the main thing we want to notice is that there's an input here with some metadata about the synthesizer itself. Let's have a look at that. Trimming that down to just, say, the input's ID and the input's manufacturer. Let's have a look over here. So the input is an OPZ, this is true, by a company called Teenage Engineering, also true. 
So let's step back a second and talk about the MIDI protocol. It's a protocol that solidified in the early 80s for synthesizers and computers to talk to each other. And as you might expect from an early 80s protocol, it's fairly 8-bit centric. So the way it works is this. You get one, two, or three 8-bit messages, three bytes. The first byte tells you what kind of message you're looking at, and the next two bytes are optional data fields. So if we look down here, what you're seeing is message 248, which is a clock pulse, um, and it doesn't need any extra data fields. That's possibly the least interesting message, so let's filter it out and see if we can get some more interesting stuff. So I'm going to pull out those three bytes by saying const uh, status data1 data2 is equal to event.message.data. And then if the status is not 248, then we'll log it. And that should reload over here. And nothing happens because we're filtering out the clock pulses. Let me press some notes. Yeah, okay. So these are more interesting messages. We've got message 133580. We'll go into exactly what that means later, but I think we've now got enough that we can start worrying about shipping it up to the cloud. I'm going to stream this data out to Kafka because it's a perfect fit for a live data stream. And I'm running Kafka on Confluent Cloud because, apart from the obvious reason, it's just an easy way to get it running. So I'm going to log in. I already have an account, which should come as no surprise. But if you want to register your own account and follow along with this project, then use the promo code CODING200 and you'll get $200 of extra free credit. So I'm going to create a cluster. Uh, I just need basic for this. It's not going to be a particularly intense application. Begin configuration. I The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change that so it runs local to me. So where's Europe? Finland, 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 London. There we go. Uh, yep, yeah, that should do it. Cluster name is fine. I'll keep the defaults. Let's go. That's going to take a moment to get going. So now's a good time to install the JavaScript libraries that we need. Back to the terminal. Let's kill that off, and I am going to add a Kafka JavaScript library. There are a couple to choose from, but I like Kafka JS the most. Um, it's not the most fully featured, but it is the nicest to work with. It's the most idiomatic JavaScript, in my opinion. I also want a bonus feature from that project. I would like to add Kafka JS. Confluent Schema Registry. So some databases make you work with type data. Uh, they force you to set a schema for all the data you're storing. And some just work on raw bytes and leave the encoding up to you. Kafka's opt-in. You can choose to, you can choose not to. I choose to. In case it's not already obvious, I prefer to work with type data. I think it just makes everyone's life easier in the long run if we all know what the data is supposed to be. With those set up, let's set this running again and see if we can connect to Kafka. I will go up here and then we'll say, let's create a Kafka client as new Kafka. And I'm going to give it a configuration, which I think I'll put in another file. Let's call that Kafka config. And then from there, I take the Kafka setup and get a producer, which is what Kafka calls a writing connection to the system. So I want to say const producer is equal to kafka.producer. Something like that will give me a write-only connection. So let's set up this config. Let's open a new file. I'm going to stick it in a file for now. If I were going to put this in production, I probably want it to come from like JSON, but just a TypeScript file will do for now. So export const kafka config like that. And that will have type Kafka config. There we go. And I should be able to import this here. So what does a Kafka config contain? Well, like most database connection stuff, it's kind of boring rote stuff that you just have to know. Let's go through it. 
you need a list of brokers, which is where you connect to on the internet to talk to Kafka. So I will get that from the cloud in a second. I am going to use SSL, no surprises there. And then I'm going to give it my connection details. The mechanism will be plain because I'm using SSL for the whole security malarkey. My username I will get from the internet in a second and my password likewise. Okay, let's go to the cloud and grab those details. So my cluster's running. Over here in cluster settings, I've got bootstrap server. That's my opening broker. So I'll stick that in there. Then I need some API keys. So I will go to data integration, API keys, create key. I uh, don't need anything fancy for this, global access. So uh, let's give it a name, MIDI world. I will copy that key into here. And that secret into there. Save those. You do know with those keys, literally anyone could access your account. Well, come on, I'm not stupid. I'm going to delete them before we publish this video. Oh, OK. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. As you were. Thank you. So let's see if that connects OK. So we've got an import to worry about. Let me just make that a little wider. And then what you do is you call producer.connect, and that gives you a promise, just like Web MIDI enabled it. And once that's ready, we should be ready to start using our producer. So let's stick that down there. Now, I can already tell this is going to get a little bit chainy promisey. So I think it's time to switch the syntax over from raw promises to async await, which is much nicer to work with. So have a look at this. I'm going to wrap this whole thing in an asynchronous function called run synth stream. All right. And then once we start, I call run synth stream here. And now because this is marked as an asynchronous function, I can switch all these promises around with a bit of different syntax. So instead of saying web MIDI enable then, I say await web MIDI being enabled, then carry on with your ordinary life. Then instead of saying producer connect then, I just say producer connect and I await that to be finished. And with that, all those promises magically disappear. Like politicians after they've been elected. Exactly. Then for the last part of this code, you might be able to guess, what we want to do is take the producer and say, here's an interesting message, send it. We just have to figure out exactly what message we're sending and where we're sending it to. And for that, we need to go back to the cloud. From over here, I'm going to set up KSQLDB. It's arguably slightly overkill for this, but I find it interesting and I want to show you some stuff about it. So, create with tutorial, fine. Global access, yes, I don't need anything fine-grained for this. The only thing I'm going to do is make sure I've got the smallest possible cluster size, because I don't need processing power for this. It's very simple. I'll launch that. That will take a couple of minutes to run, so by the magic of the internet, it's up and running. So if I click in, I get an SQL prompt. And from here, I can create a place for all my MIDI event messages to be stored. So I'll say create stream raw MIDI messages. And I shall give it a schema. I think we'll take the source ID from that MIDI web MIDI input object. And that's going to be a varchar. And I'm going to make that my key, as in every single event with the same source ID is to be considered part of the same stream of information. I'll also cre keep that manufacturer because it's nice to have a bit more metadata in here. Then the most important thing, I need to keep my three MIDI bytes. So status is an integer, data one is an integer, and data two is an integer. Okay. Now I'm going to need some configuration options for this, but let's do a bit of error message driven design and see what errors we get and that will teach us which configuration options we need. So if I run that, missing required property Kafka topic. What's a Kafka topic? 
Well, if a stream is a typed series of events, then a topic is the underlying untyped key value binary pairs. Um, it's not really an important distinction for this project, so I'm just going to say Kafka topic, give it the same name as the stream. There are times and reasons you wouldn't want to, but we're not going into that. How's that? Next one, missing value format. Okay, so remember I said that a schema is opt-in. You've got some configuration options with that opt-in schema. So you could say we're going to store all our schemas as Google protocol buffs or JSON schema. I'm going to go with the de facto standard, which is the value format should be Avro. I quite like Avro. Let's go with that. So this one's saying we're missing the partitions option. So again, this is kind of slightly outside of the scope of what we're doing, but we can split up the underlying stream topic data bytes thing into several sharded partitions. That's great for scaling. I don't think this project is going to need much scaling. So I'm just going to say the partitions we're fine with one for this project. Absolutely fine. Let's run that. And that should give us a place that's created it. That will give us a place to store our data. And what that's done is created the right space on disk underlying in Kafka. And it's also registered this schema with a schema registry. So if I go over here and here we go, view and manage schemas, raw MIDI messages value. And if I click there, there we go. That is an Avro definition formatted as JSON for our data. So we've got a place to store all the data, we've got types, it's time to go back to JavaScript and do the actual sending. Back in TypeScript land, producer.send expects to be told which topic we're sending data to, and we know the name of that now, it's raw MIDI messages. And then you just give it an array of messages, and I'm going to send them one at a time, and each message is an object with a key and a value, appropriately encoded. So the key, what's the key? We decided when we set when we called create stream that the key was going to be the input ID. And the value is a little trickier because it can't just be a JSON object. We have to actually send encoded bytes. So we're going to ask something to encode uh, a raw MIDI message, which will look like this. The source manufacturer will be the input manufacturer. And then uh, we've got the status field, the data fields, and you'll notice I've had to fold the keys to uppercase so that it fits in with the way the schema registry expects it. Sort of wish I had more control over that. I don't. We'll live. Okay, so how do you encode that JSON object as an Avro data stream? Well, you're going to need to know what the raw MIDI message schema is. And then you're going to need to speak to a schema registry with a client and call encode on it. Something, something of that shape. So let's take these up here and define those like this. Uh, I'll fill that in in a second, and likewise I will fill that in in a second. So the schema registry client will be a new schema registry, and that I will configure with a schema registry config, which I will fill in in just a second. Oh, I'm missing a comma down there. Okay, I think we're getting there. So let's go and fill in one of these. I'll put it in config. And I will say uh, export const schema registry config. That will be of type schema registry API client args. Bit of a mouthful. What's that config object? You need to tell it the host where it will find the schema registry because it won't necessarily be on the same server as Kafka itself. Uh, and even if it was, it would probably be on a different port. So the host will fill in a second. And then we need some authentication details, which will be a username and a password. Okay, 
back to the cloud and we'll pick up those details. So if I click schema registry at the top here, API endpoint is my host. So let me copy and paste that in. Then a username and password. I will create some down here. So I click create key and that will give me some fields. I'll call that MIDI world uh, schema registry. So I copy that key and that's my username and the secret is my password. Again, I'm going to delete those details before this video is published, so don't bother, just don't bother. So I go back over here and if I import that, we're getting there. Last step is to talk to that schema registry client and say get the latest schema ID for raw MIDI messages hyphen value. Let me put that over there. You remember it's if we go back here and click down on there, it's that is the subject name we need when we're getting the schema ID. So where does that put us? Down here, raw MIDI messages is a promise of a number, not a number. So that means that this is an asynchronous call and I haven't awaited it. If I do that, it will magically unwrap the promise and give me the result. And then I think we've got the same problem here. Value is also a promise. If I await the result of that, it should be correctly encoded. And the problem there is I can't await here because this event handler is not an asynchronous function. So I'll fix that. I'll just make it one. And with that, I think we might actually have some working code. Let's try it out. First test, let's play some notes and see if it explodes. It doesn't seem to be exploding. Let's go over to here. And I am going to get myself a KSQL prompt. Click through and I'm going to say select star from raw MIDI messages. And I want to watch as new messages come in. So I'm not going to make it a one-time query. I'm going to omit the changes live. Let's run that. And I'm not expecting it to see anything yet, but if I start playing some notes... There we go. We've got streaming data coming through. Let's just take a look at one of these. That's exactly what I expect to see. Okay, so we've got synthesizer to cloud, and now we can start trying to build out the other half of the app. Time then for a little bit of stream processing. What we'll do is have a look at these raw MIDI messages that we're now storing in the cloud and kind of pull apart their structure and turn them into something a bit richer, a bit more semantically meaningful. So have a look at this second most recent message. This has status code 149, data 1 is 60, data 2 is 100. What does that mean? Well, the MIDI spec says that anything with a status code from 144 to 159 is, I pressed a note. And let's see, 144, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49 means uh, that I've pressed a note on the sixth channel. So uh, in the case of this instrument, it's not percussion or bass sounds, it's the lead sound is the sixth channel. So I'm pressing a lead soundish note. Um, data one is the pitch of that note. So 60 is middle C, roughly the middle of a piano, if this were a traditional piano. And data two is how hard you press the note. So some synthesizers will respond to pressing it lightly or heavily, and that will be a value from zero to 127. 8-bit value. So this is a note on middle C at a fairly strong velocity. If I look at the most recent note, this is 133.60.0, which actually means note off on channel 6. The note we're turning off is middle C, and the velocity is zero. So it's basically meaning I've taken my finger off that note. So we have note on and note off. That's probably enough to start processing an enriched data stream and carry on with the app. So let's build out those parts. 
First, we'll create a place to hold a richer stream of data. So let's say create stream MIDI notes. And I want this to be structurally fairly similar to the raw MIDI message, but it's going to have a bit more meaning. It's going to have a little bit of transformation, some filtering. Basic, but interesting, I think. So I will keep a couple of fields like source ID and source manufacturer. Manufacturer. It's incredibly hard to type and talk about at the same time, words like manufacturer. Then, I want to pull out the specific channel we're talking about. Are we talking about drums or bass? Uh, on a good day, we're talking about drum and bass. I will pull out the pitch, and the velocity is the term they use for note-hitting hardness. Velocity is the technical term. So we've got to create that with some options, and the options are going to be basically the same as last time. My Kafka topic, I can't think of any reason not to give it the same name. My value format, I will not switch encoding formats mid-project. Nobody needs that hassle. And partitions, I still can't think of a good reason to have more than one for this particular case. So let's create that. And that's done. I can probably see it over here. Yep, MIDI notes. Okay, so we need to start shoveling data from raw MIDI messages into MIDI notes with a bit of transformation along the way. And the way we do that is going to look fairly familiar if you know your SQL, but also it's subtly different. So let's say insert into MIDI notes, select uh, something from raw MIDI messages. What do we want to select? Well, first we're going to deal with those MIDI note on messages. So let's say anything where the status is between 144 and 159. Just getting those numbers from the MIDI spec. What do I want to select? Well, I'll keep the source ID and the source manufacturer as is. I need to specify the channel, that's the structure of MIDI notes, and that is simply going to be the status code minus 144, give us, which gives us a zero indexed channel. If we're in that range between 144 and 159, then I know that data 1 is the pitch, and data 2 is the velocity. Right, so looks good to me, let's run that and check that it's successful. Yes, it is. So, interesting subtle difference. If you ran something like this in a relational database, you would expect it to run through all the rows in raw MIDI message, create a new row in MIDI notes, and stop, and that's the job done. It doesn't quite work that way in a streaming database. It's actually more alive. Every time a new raw MIDI message comes in, that insert statement will be running in the background, picking it up, transforming it, and sticking a new event in MIDI notes. So this is like an insert select, but it's a living insert select that's constantly running in the background, looking to transform new data in real time. And I think that's kind of fun, because it makes it possible to quite, quite concisely build these data transformation pipelines. We're going to need one more. We need to think about the MIDI note off messages. And that's going to look very, very similar. MIDI note off is just going to be any message between 128 and 143. And that's just what the spec says. So if I take 128 away from the status, that gives me the same channel as the MIDI note on. And the only thing I'm going to change there is Data 2 on a MIDI note off message should always be zero, uh, should have no velocity, no hardness for pressing the key, but I'm just going to force that, just in case I ever connect a synthesizer with a slightly weird implementation of the spec. So if I run that, and check it works okay, yep. So this is also interesting, we've now got two different insert queries, looking at the same source data in different ways, transforming them slightly differently, and sticking them into the same resulting enriched stream. So I've got different logic creating that transformation. And it's always happening live in the background. 
And now I've got these MIDI notes where I can just look at one thing and say, oh, it's on, oh, it's off. Life should be fairly easy. And that should be enough for us to go and create a front end off of it. Let's just have a look at this persistent queries tab, because this is the place where we can see all those little background running micro jobs that are transforming things for us. And we can see they're both running. OK, back to TypeScript land, and it's time to build a web server and then finally a front end. You, my friend, should go make a cup of tea. Yeah, good idea. I'm going to go and make a cup of tea. We'll be back in two seconds. I have tea. Hey, where's my cup? Well, with, with the same, with the same, never mind. I'll make you a cup of tea later. Let's write a web server. Okay, let's start building a WebSocket server. Import that from WS and say const server is a new WebSocket.server. Let's run it on the classic choice, which is port 8080, and say server.on connection. Whenever you get a connection to this WebSocket server, give me the client that's connected and we'll do some work. Uh, let's just check this is working. So client.send hello. OK, Nodemon should rerun that automatically. If I open another terminal and use my favorite WebSocket debugging tool, WS, which is a lot like Telnet for regular ports. Um, it's just it's just a go-to client for the command line. That should say, hello, OK, we've got a working WebSocket server. So let's think about how we're going to flesh this out. I am going to say that whenever someone connects, I'll create a connection to Confluent Cloud to start reading Kafka data out. And I'll just stream it to them. It's going to be a fairly straightforward networking, echoing WebSocket server. So a lot of that I can get from the synth to cloud code. I know I'm going to need a schema registry. And I know I'm going to need a Kafka setup. And instead of saying, you see here we've got Kafka.producer, what I'm going to do is for each client, I'm going to say, a consumer, which is the read-only counterpart to the producer's write-only connection. I'm going to say kafka.consumer to get me a read-only consumer. And I will await that consumer connecting. That means this will have to be an asynchronous callback. OK. I need to configure that consumer. And there's only one configuration setting I need to worry about at this point, which is the group ID. What group do I want this connection to belong to for work sharing purposes? Way outside the scope of this project. So I just need any unique string so that there's no work sharing. Each connection gets its own stream of data. What can I use as group ID? Um, I can't think of a better option than just using a UUID. So come back over here. I am going to need to yarn add UUID and the types for UUID. Good. And then the import's slightly tricky because there are a few different versions of UUID in the UUID library. And I want to import v4 as a UUID function and not worry about anything else. So that should do that. Let's throw in a few extra imports. Uh, yeah. And that and that all from the configuration we created earlier. And that should give me a connected, running, awaited, initialized, working Kafka consumer. So what do I do with it? Well, I need it to subscribe to that stream of incoming MIDI notes. So let's say consumer.subscribe to the topic MIDI notes. And then I have to tell it what to do each time a new MIDI note message event comes through. So you do that like this. Let's pull this into its own window. You say consumer.run some bit of code. Let's have a look at the source code, figure this out. So consumer.run takes a consumer run config. And consumer run config has a handler for each message you get coming in. I think that's what we want. So like this. 
What's the type of an each message handler? That is, I get a payload and I return a promise of void. Easy way to return a promise of void is to say, here's an asynchronous function. Uh, that's not going to return anything. And that does the magic wrapping it up as a promise. Malarkey. So each message payload. So what should the each message payload callback do every time it gets a come incoming MIDI note message? I don't know. So I'm just going to log it to the console and see what we get. Console.log payload. OK, let's do the import dance. That should be running. Should we see if it works? So WebSocket localhost. That looks like it's connecting up here. Let's play a few notes. And we have an error. The font size makes it a bit tricky to see, but have a look there. Kafka JS not implemented, snappy compression not implemented. This is a mismatch between compression types. So the default kind of compression that Confluent Cloud uses is called snappy. But Kafka JS doesn't know about it by default, so we have to teach it. It's not hard. Um, it'll take a couple of lines of code, but it's worth knowing about because if you ever write your own Kafka JS Confluent Cloud code, this is going to come up. So all I have to do is say yarn add Kafka JS snappy library. It's a separate library. And over here, I'm going to say import the snappy codec coder decoder that's what codec means from uh kafka js snappy and then i say hey you know those compression codecs you keep a list of well i'd like to teach you about a new one there is a compression type called snappy which you've heard of but the way you do that process is you use this snappy codec pair of functions object i've got if we were writing JavaScript, that would be the job done. For TypeScript, we need one extra step. This Kafka JS snappy library doesn't currently, at the time of recording this, have TypeScript support. There's a pull request open. I hope it gets merged. But in the meantime, I'm just going to say, just this once as a special treat, you can ignore type checking for this line. And that will just skip along happily. With that, let's create a new client connection, play some notes, and see if it works this time. Yeah, we have data. So let's have a look at this. Each one of these payloads, it has a message key, and it has, sorry, it has a message uh, field, and that message contains a key buffer and a value buffer, which is what I want to look at. So let's process those. If I come down here and change payload, destructure out that message, because it's the only field I care about. And then I want to do something a bit like this. I want to say const key is the messages key, and const value is the messages uh, value. But not quite that, because um, I've got to call to string on the key field to turn that buffer into an actual string. And key may be null, so I have to wrap that in a little bit of null checking uh, like this. Right? Similar problem for message.value. I want to decode that, but this time not using to string. It's going to be Avro encoded, so I need to use my schema registry client to Avro decode it. So I'm going to do something quite similar to when we encoded it. I will say schema registry client dot decode that message value. And just like message key, that could be null. So let's add some null handling. Something like that. Now, if I take out that hello message and replace it with a send of JSON stringify Every time we get a key value, let's ship that off to the connected client. That looks good to me. Let's go over to the terminal, connect a client, and try playing some notes. 
and we have Jason coming through on a connected client. So that's uh, that's it for the back end programming. Really, we we are now sending data from this synthesizer up to the cloud, processing it in the cloud and bringing it back down through a WebSocket server, where a front end client will be able to connect to it. That takes us to the last and probably the most fun part of this whole project. We're going to build a 3D visualization of those notes as they stream around in real time. So, last mile. Time for one last terminal window. And a last few libraries. So, yarn add a development time library. I'm going to use parcel, uh, which is a bit like Webpack, if you know that. It's your live reloading front end handy dandy tool, a bit like Nodemon that we've used for the back end stuff. That will take a while to spin in. And for 3D rendering, I'm going to use three. Nice name. And the TypeScript types for three. OK, let's edit an index.html file with the basic preamble, uh, a head, and then a body tag. How many times have I written this in my career, I wonder? And let's get this all set up. So yarn uh, parcel index.html minus minus open. And that should start a live reloading server with index.html as its root. Yep. OK, let's just prove that that's live reloading by sticking an exclamation mark in. I save it, it reloads. Cool. OK, so on to our first, actually our only, script tag. Type is a module, and the source I want to find in source ui.ts can't find it. Of course you can't, because I haven't created it yet. UI.ts. There we go. Um, right. A 3D rendering engine. So the way this works, I'll just sketch it out and then we'll fill in the details. The way 3JS wants you to render a 3D scene is you say, create a 3D scene. And then we're going to add some lights, camera action, add, th add things like objects in the world add a camera, then we render it out, and voila, we've got a 3D rendering engine going, as long as we just fill in all those gaps, make it look easy. Now I've got to actually add the detail. So, scene is an easy part. To create a scene, you say new scene, and you just make sure you import that from the right place. Okay. And then we'll fill in the rest in a second, but let's think about rendering. So, to render, you need a renderer, and I will use a WebGL renderer. Yes. And that renderer is going to take two arguments for this code, a canvas tag, which is embedded in the HTML, and the magic word anti-alias true. If you are a child of the 8-bit gaming era, you've probably encountered anti-aliasing several times. Where do we get that canvas tag? Well, I'll just say const canvas is document get element by ID uh, 3. I'll just, and then I go down here and create that canvas tag with the ID of 3. Right, and then the problem here, if you have a look at that, um, it can be null. Let me just make that a bit larger. So the, re the result of get element by ID might return null. We have to handle that or TypeScript will complain. So I'll just say if canvas. There we go. So then to render out, you say renderer dot render, give it a scene to render and a camera to look at that scene with. So we need to create our camera. That's the next step. Let's say our camera is a new perspective camera. And that needs four arguments to initialize. You need to give it, the first thing is the field of view. Now I'm going to make a confession and say, I always just copy 75 from the documentation. I, 
sorry, I'm not that sophisticated in my 3D uh, 3D rendering. Uh, so magic number 75. Then we need the aspect ratio, which I do understand. That needs to be the inner width divided by the inner height if we want it full screen. Then you need to define which objects are so close to the camera that there's actually no point rendering them. I'm going to say if you're closer than 0.1 of a unit, you are too close to be bothered with. And then the last one is what's so far away it's not worth rendering. It'd be like a little pixel on the screen. It's just wasting CPU. And I will say anything over 100 is just too far away to look at. And those should be pretty good values. If I save that, I get a black square. How exciting. Uh, let's try and make that a little more exciting. So the first thing to do is set the size of this renderer. Renderer.setSize, and I will reuse that window.innerWidth and window.innerHeight to make it a full screen black box. Let's change, just so you can see this is actually doing something, let's change the scene's background to a new color, and I'll use a favorite CSS color of mine, Alice Blue, which is a sort of light sky blue, which I need to import. And there we go, we've got a light sky blue box. Okay, to make that a bit more interesting, we're gonna to need to add things. What things should we add? Let's just start with a nice block, a nice square block. So in 3JS, things are called meshes, and a mesh has a shape, a geometry, it's called, and then a material. How does it interact with light when you bounce off it? So if I took a Rubik's cube, that would have the shape of a square, a cube, and the material would look plasticky, right? So let's create a new mesh and we will give it a new uh, box geometry. And I'm going to give that a size of a cube, 111. And then it needs a new, it needs a mesh. How does it react to light? And I will use mesh standard material. I won't configure anything on that yet. And then I say scene. Here's a new thing to add to you. Add a block. Now we don't see that yet, and the reason for that is the camera starts at position 0, 0, 0, and the block starts at position 0, 0, 0. So we're inside the block, and normally 3JS won't render the inside walls of an object. So what we need to do is take our camera and pull it out. So let's go, um, let's just go left a bit and up a bit and out a bit. And there we go. We've got something that looks roughly like a 3D cube. It'll be a bit better if I see camera dot look at the block position. There. That's almost convincingly a 3D cube. I think we should do two things to make this a bit more convincing. Let's animate it so you can see around the sides, and we need to light it so it doesn't just show up black. Let's start with the animation. That's the most fun. So, I instead of rendering once, I'm going to wrap this in a, uh, let's call it a tick function. And every time there's a new frame to render, I will re-render. So what I want to do is say wrap that in a function and then tell the window that whenever it's time to render a new animation frame, call that function again. And then if I call it once to kick it off, that's going to go in a constant loop requesting a new animation frame. And when it's time for that animation frame, we recall render. If I save that, you don't see anything because we aren't making any changes. Well, what we're seeing is a perfect animation of nothing much happening. So we need to put in some changes to the scene so we can see it. Let's take the block and rotate it. And that should give us enough to prove that this is animated. We could just rotate it by a fixed amount, but the right way to do this, the sophisticated way to do this, is to create a 3JS clock object. And... We can use that to say how much time has elapsed between this frame and the last frame. And if we use that, we'll get smooth animations even if the computer slows down a bit and drops the frame rate. 
So let's say const delta time is clock dot get delta. And then we can rotate x by that delta. And let's just see what that gives us. Yeah, that's all right, actually. I was expecting to have to scale that, but that's OK. Um, I would just I would rather it rotated that way. So that's the y axis. Yeah. OK. Um, lighting. Let's add a light. Uh, if you are a professional video person, you may want to stop your ears right now because I'm just going to use one light. And I gather that in the video world, that's something of a heresy. Let's just add a single spotlight to light this scene. Um, new spotlight. Uh, it can be pure white. And I will move it. Uh, set the position to let's move it sideways a bit, up a fair bit, back quite a lot. And then we have to add it to the scene, otherwise it won't render. So spotlight. And there we go. That, I think, is a fairly convincing basic 3D animation. And you know, if you just took from this, if you just took that one file and ran off to play with it, you can have hours of fun. Uh, this is a really fun library to play with. But we have work to do. So I need, you know, I'm going to add one more thing to this scene before we start really thinking about turning it into a visualization of notes. I'm going to add a floor just to give a sense of space. So const floor is another new mesh. This time we will use a plane geometry. 50-50 should work. And a new mesh standard material. Let's uh, let's color this one in. I'll show you an option. You can use any CSS color as well as a few other options. So let's say um, linen. Did you know? Top trivia. One of the CSS colors is linen. Uh, one day, if you've never done it, look up the list of CSS colors because there are some really spicy choices in there. Let's take that and say scene.add floor. OK, OK, that's so we've got a plane that's there. What I want to do is rotate it so it's a floor. OK, so scene dot, uh, sorry, floor dot rotate. Uh, that is the x-axis by who remembers radians from uh, from their teenage years i need to rotate it by a quarter circles worth of radians so that is math dot pi divided by two no it's not divided by minus two yes it is okay so now we've got a plane the last problem there is the plane is sitting at the origin point and the box is sitting at the origin point so we're slicing half the box off I can solve that by taking the block, taking its position, and setting it to be same x point up half a cube's worth on y, same z point, and that just lifts it up a bit. OK. I could add shading. That would be nice. But for time's sake, I think we should move on and uh, leave, sh leave shadow rendering as an exercise to the reader. So the last tweak I'll make to the setup of the scene is instead of having a single block, I'd like one block for each channel on the synthesizer, one for each different kind of sound it can make. And then we've got different things that can react to different sounds. So let's create an array of blocks. Uh, since that's an empty array, we won't be able to infer the type in TypeScript. So I'm going to say explicitly that this is an empty, this is an array of meshes. Then. How many channels do we have? Max channels is 8 and 4. Var i is equal to 0. i is less than... Ma How many times have I written this? i++. plus uh, plus. Let's wrap that whole thing like that. And then, inside this bit of code, I'm going to say blocks.push each block you create. Good. Now I need to jump to all the places uh, where I've defined block and instead say blocks, look at some block. There we go. Uh, block for var i is, no, actually, blocks.for each. 
block. You go through the array of blocks and rotate every one of them. And now the reason that's not quite working is we now have eight blocks rotating, but they're all in exactly the same spot and rotating at exactly the same speed. So let's have a look at this position. Let's do this and say, um, let's give it a row and a column. And the row can be the index divided by maximum number of channels, uh, math.floor. And the column can be the index modulo, the max number of channels. And then if we put x as the row and uh, z as the column, let's see what that gives us. Whoa! Okay, uh, not quite, not quite, but close. Let's uh, let's pan the camera out. So let's uh, go up a fair bit and back quite a bit. Okay, a bit closer. Um, mod max channels is wrong. Let's do it mod 4 and 5 by 4. Let's try that. Closer still. Um, I think it needs more spacing out, so let's do double that. Yes, good. Uh, I think I've moved the camera too far back. And you find this, like, rendering 3JS stuff, you just muck around with the numbers and see what works. Um, let's look at a different block. Let's look at two. Mm, that's a bit weird. Three. Even weirder. Five. Mm, that'll do. That'll do for now. Okay, last thing is, let's colour these blocks in to make them a bit more distinct. So, I'm going to say when we initialise each block, uh, take its material, take its colour, and set the hue, saturation, lightness to... Um, we need three values. The hue is the particular shade, um, and that needs to be between 0 and 1. So let's do I divided by max channels. The saturation, how rich should the colour be? Let's try half. The lightness, let's try half. Let's see what that gives us. Oh, okay. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, should we try a bit lighter? No, too light. Should we try a bit more saturated? Yeah, okay, that works for me. Um... Okay, we've got eight blocks, each representing one of eight channels. So the last step is to connect to our WebSocket server and start using that data. And then we'll finally be there. We can actually play some music and the lights will dance before our very eyes. I am ready for that moment. You're always ready. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So down to the bottom of the file and let's create a new WebSocket client connection. Uh, we connect over the WS protocol to localhost 8080. And we say to that WebSocket client, here's what you do whenever you get a message. Here's your event handler for that event. I will just log that to the screen for now. Got event. And let's see what we've got. Okay. Open the console over here. And what we get is a failed connection. Now, I've seen this before, and I know what it is. The problem is, we've got all our source files in one directory, and three different processes watching for file changes in those directories. We've got the synth to uh, cloud process, we've got the cloud to WebSocket server process, and we've got the front end. And when you save any one of them, all three of them restart. And that's going to be a problem, because as soon as we restart, we try to connect to the server, which hasn't finished coming up yet. So, we can fix that by going back to these NodeMon processes, and just for now, we will ignore source UI.typescript. If this were a larger productionized project, we would probably split these out into separate directories and watch them separately. But for now, this will do. That should do it. So, if I pull these back up and restart, now the WebSocket server keeps running even when we make changes to the front end 
and it should connect just fine. So if I play some notes now, I get some events. Let's have a look at one of these. Um, it's a message event. It has a data field, and that is my JSON string I'm looking for. So let's say that const payload is json.parse the events data. And let's have a look at that payload. It's got the key we expect. It's got the value we expect. Let's take that value and we've got eight channels, we've got eight blocks. So what we want to try and do is get that MIDI note onto the block. That is easily done. We can say if there is a block with the same index as that payload value channel, then take that payload, take that block and assign to its user data field, which three gives us for exactly this kind of purpose, and say the MIDI note is the payload value. Um, this code actually makes me really want if let from Rust, uh, but we don't have that, and we will just live with the world as it is. Okay. Now, that every time we play a note and we receive it from the WebSocket, it should be attached to the specific block. So we can go up to the specific block here and say, hey there, block, if you have a user data MIDI note field, we're going to do something with that. Uh, let's pull it out. Is that. Uh, and let's make that a bit neater. There we go. Uh, what should we do? Let's say, just for now, we'll take the block and its position and set its Y value to the MIDI notes pitch. So that should go up and down depending on how high or low the note is. Let's see if that works. Um, sort of. Okay, that block has completely disappeared. And I think that's because middle C is 60, and I've just shot the block up 60 units into the air, and it's jumped off the screen. So let's divide that by 10, and see if we get something a bit more sensible. Still too high. Let's divide it by 20. Yeah, okay. Let's go an octave lower. Go a couple of octaves lower. There we go. Okay, something like that. Let's pull that out and say new y is equal to that. And uh, six, I think we should try and scale this down. So let's say, let's take the pitch and subtract 40. And then let's make sure that that's no lower than zero and try that. I think that's a bit too small now. Let's, again, with playing with numbers. Yeah, we're almost there. I think we want to use one more small 3JS feature, um, which is we want to smoothly move between positions as it changes, which we can do with something like this. Const old y is equal to block dot position dot y and then we have this wonderfully named function called lerp which will linear linearly interpolate between two positions so it's going to move a little bit of the distance between where it is now and where it wants to get to by saying lerp the old y to the new y by i found a tenth often works in the past again some notes oh do you see that so smooth. Okay. Okay, I think now we can have some fun with this. I'll do one more thing. One more thing before we actually get to playing some music. I think I'm going to try swapping the row and column round. Uh, and get my commas right. That looks a bit nicer. One more thing. Let's switch 
off the console and come down to the camera and bring that in a little bit because I think it's too far out now. Yeah, okay. Okay, I think we're ready to actually play some music. To save time, I've pre-programmed a little tune on this, so let's give it a go. On the kick drum, that's on the red block. Let's add in some... Okay, a bit of percussion. Yeah, a bit more percussion. Okay, let's make that a bit more dramatic. And maybe bring the bass block up. Uh, and pull the camera out a bit. Yeah. Let's bring the percussion back a bit. Let's push that over there. Uh, yeah, that's roughly what I want. A bit more. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Can I borrow your, um... Yeah, thank you. Okay. Let's try something. I think we've lost him. He's lost to the land of Groove. Um, I'll have to finish up. Uh, obviously, you know, there are places we could take this code. Um, we could do a lot to beef up the animations and the lighting of that scene. We have a complete set of events with timing information with clock pulses. So we've got everything we need to play it back at a later date in a different place in several places around the world. Um, we could consider connecting it to someone else's synthesizer to have the same music with different sounds. Or we could start building up a system that lets you collaborate on a track, going back and forth and adding pieces. But I think that's enough for now. Let's stop there. I hoped you enjoyed watching him build a whole new event system, and I really hope it gets you started with your own projects. We'll put a link to the source code in the description so you can check it out. And if you want to see more complete builds, you know, let us know. Leave a thumbs up, leave a comment, uh, let us know which languages you're interested in. Let us know if you enjoyed it. And with that, we'll be back soon. Thanks for watching.